this week, um, we're going to leverage experiences we've all got, including me and Ruby and all of you, to try and talk about advanced concepts in 3D design and like 2.5D design, which is a really interesting process. We've got some real examples to look at with us, and then lots of others that we can talk about and look at and consider. Um, and so this is going to cover sort of a big grab bag of things. Some of them we have talked about a little bit, and so it'll be neat to recap any experience that we've got. And others are things that it will be fun to, to talk about and see where people are if you have any questions or things that will pop to, popped up in your head. Um, this is also, and the time flies by, but this is, this is going to be Ruby's last class with us, where she's one of the co-instructors. Um, and it's a delight every time. And uh, I just want to make sure that we we pick her brain for all the interesting and creative things that, that's in there. So anything we, we feel like chatting about, we should. And we're, we're going to hit a whole bunch of stuff. So um, up first, we're going to talk about a, a whole range, like I said, but this is a mousetrap car that my students at the last school in Cleveland designed, and it was made out of cardboard, which doesn't feel like a lot, but that mousetrap car could go 12 and a half meters and stop within a third of a millimeter of its target distance. And it could do, it could make that travel in under four seconds. Mm -hmm. So like, it's a little crazy, but those are the sorts of things. And if you take the wheels, the wheels are not strong. But if you took the wheels off, you could I could stand on the body of that car and it would not break. Standard, like normal Amazon box cardboard is a default 220 pound edge crush test. Mm -hmm. So if you get it arranged correctly, most of us would be able to stand on it without a problem. Just a while. You can really build structural things out of cardboard without an issue. We're gonna talk about all that. So um just sort of exploring, and this is, we're not going to watch the whole video of this, but a big part of what we're going to talk about this week is two and a half deconstruction. And we've already seen pieces of this. This is making the Wacom tablet. Uh, but the real feature I think that's that's shown in the video is that these processes are general, generalized, used in a general sense. So like you can use the same designs for the laser as you do for the Gerber. And all of them, I started off in Fusion 360 and then played around in Inkscape and then brought them to whatever scale we needed. Um, it works really well. And actually, like because those slots are sized to the thickness of the material, the whole model, you can just scale up or down to match the thickness of the material you've got. And that sets the ratio. So there's like the little model downstairs made out of three millimeter plywood. I just took the whole model and scaled it down from the it was what 12 or 16, 16 millimeters is three quarters of an inch, something like that, roughly. And so I scaled it from 16 millimeters down to three millimeters. So it's a like a four to one scale, five to one scale, roughly for the little one to the big one, which is which is fascinating. But these skills, in addition to being useful to make things, they let you access different types of materials and the processes can work on all sorts of scales. So it's an interesting thing to work with. Unfortunately, because I was assembling this and didn't think to set up a camera, there's no like assembly video, which is a bummer, but um, so all those pieces just click together. There's lots of other good examples. It, it, yeah, yeah. In the video, it showed you like paused a bunch of times to vacuum. Oh, yeah. You don't have to. I just wanted to make it visible in the video. Oh, sorry. Karen. Yeah, you can just run it. So. It's fine. I don't know if that was like to get cleaner cuts or just. It can loosely be, but it's not that big of a deal. It was mostly for the video. Oh. Yeah. Um, in here, these are other things made in two and a half D, and we can take a look at some of that in a bit. Um, but these are neat, neat things to think about. These are other ways you can make specifically designed for the laser. This was for our school board. The school board members, we wanted to make thank you gifts for them helping with the fab lab and all those. Uh, it's it's different than that. I think that might actually be misspelled, but it's it's fine. Um, the, they got a correctly spelled one later, but all of that is a laser product. So we designed the shape and used a software called Slicer for Fusion 360 that we'll talk about um, and turned it into these like multi uh, multi part things that could be assembled out of flat material for the laser. 
And so we're going to talk about that and sort of step back and think about some of the big concepts that we have probably played with a little bit as we explore and looked at examples like that. Um, also, the two color plastic that you use to make those signs is delightfully cheap and super easy to work with in the laser. The black layer is very, very thin, like a half of a millimeter. And so the one pass of the laser, you get real crisp, clear names. Um, so that's how they make all the like door signs and desk signs and all that. It's not any more expensive than any other color. Um, but we're going to talk about G-code, advanced 3D printing concepts, 3D scanning, which is fun, a little bit more in depth about 2.5D and like how you can do that manually or with an automated process, and then a bit more on DXFs, which we have explored slightly here, but we'll talk about it. So G-code is a general concept. We've talked about this many different ways. But it's good to think about G-code as just a generalized machine control language. So anything that runs like a CNC where it can move in three dimensions. So that includes the Gerber and the Shapoko and the Tormach, but also the 3D printers and probably maybe the, the embroidery CNC machine and definitely the hot wire CNC that there is and a few different types of machines, they all run with G-code as their control. A proper machinist will know how to read and write this, but it started in the 1950s, and luckily we're 70 years on from that, and you don't need to write or read any of it by hand if you're a maker, just as a general heads up. If you want to level up, you can, but don't. Um, this is NC Viewer, which is really nice. If you ever want to see what your G-code looks like, you can go to ncviewer.com, plug in your G-code, just like open the file, and it'll show you what it looks like, and it'll walk you through the process of it doing the cut. It can be really helpful if you need to conceptualize what the machine's going to do before it does it. Um, so let's talk a bit about the 3D printing part of this and some advanced tricks. So we've got Octopi, which is great. Um, you can really get deep in the weeds with Octopi. There's the different tabs that are going on. And I suppose I can just open it up if I'm on the Wi-Fi. Um, oh, cool. So if we go to here and we open this up, we're printing on, we've got two. Loaded. We'll we'll just let two load. Maybe there's nothing going on. Yeah, but in here you've got all sorts of different options. It looks like someone's actively printing, so I'm not going to mess with them too much. Uh, but here's this thing going on. If you want to play around with the layers or control or the histories, you can do all that. Learning sort of how to navigate this file system down here can be burdens a little tricky, but it's it's good to do. Look around, see if we can find seven. You said yeah. Do -do -do. Go to there. And so seven has got the same Maybe deal. Six, whichever one's on the right. Yeah. Oh, I think it's six. We'll see. And they take a minute to load. Yeah. Remember, these are run on a Raspberry Pi. I think seven is the one I got on the plate with. Ah. That's why I moved over to six. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Six is the one you have to log into. Yeah. And so. The one closest to the wall, right? Oh, here's yeah. one a wall hook in PETG. No, that's not. Nope. Not yet. I'm in seven. All right. So they're all busy, which is good. Um, but you can see sort of job progress, play around with this. There's a lot of detail you can get into. There's even like user accounts and settings. Um, the more nerdy you get in the details of this, the, the more interesting you can finally tune and control your process. The same exact thing goes, goes along with Prusa Slicer. The more you learn the details of the Prusa Slicer app, the more you can control what's going on. And so we're going to talk about that in a minute. But... Um, oh yeah, look at this. Here's somebody's thing printing away. And it's just fun to see it sort of going live because you can watch it finish the layers as it goes across the layer. And this is as it goes through the whole process. So they're close to done. Makes sense over here. Um, seeing how that works is very helpful. These Octopi, you can only see while you're here, but the if you haven't done it yet, the Mark Forged and the Form Labs you can see from home. Those are neat that you can sort of get updates without needing to be here. Um, and so let's head back over to the slides. So you play around with these and it's really helpful, but as you get better and better at 3D printing and 3D design, and that's deliberately playing without noise, um, you can navigate through how you wanna generate supports. And so there's like these tree supports that are really neat. It minimizes the amount of material and it builds them in an interesting way that, that will support where it needs to and not anywhere that it doesn't. Um, because if you print unsupported, that's what you get, right? It's kind of fun, but it's not that helpful. And it limits the amount of material that it takes to do the things. 
if you're strategic and you're less than 45 degrees in your overhang, you get a nice vertical um, motion that doesn't need supports. If you're at 45 degrees, you don't need supports. Oh, those are kind of fun. Look at that. Uh, and then here, if you have more than 45 degrees, you start to need supports. So like these are the motor mounts in my robot bartender. And I specifically designed them to not need supports. Like if you look at them carefully, I print them in a weird orientation. I print them on a face that isn't their bottom, but that's because it's the printable face that makes them print without needing any supports. There's no overhangs. And I realized I didn't even need this piece in the back. So the, the current version is even shorter. Um, so you can be very strategic in how you do that. This neat thing that's double colored up here. We don't have any dual color printers, but there totally are. Um, and then you can print in multiple colors. Another thing that's really neat because Prusa Slicer has opened is that you can, on my other screen, mm -hmm. dissolvable, support printing. dissolvable supports are a thing. They, they dissolve in hot water. And so it works really well, sort of. Everything turns slimy, but it is fun. And so if you have access to a dual extruder, it's a neat thing to do. I wonder if I have any 3D models in my downloads. <laughs> Dazzling go go. Oh, it's a doghouse. Hi. Uh, in in here, there's other advanced things. So if you're in simple, you lose sort of the process. As you get deeper and deeper, it's neat to see a slice on something like this. And if you drag your progress down, you can see sort of where it'll go. But you can also add in dividers. And then when the printer gets to this point in its process. Before it transitions from orange to green, it's going to stop and do beep, beep, beep at me. So if you have something where you want to change the color, we only have one color in our extruder at a time, but you can program in a break where it switches colors. So if you have a thing that you orient in a certain way, you can make it print going up. And so that's a neat way to do it. I've done a lot of one of the things that we tried to do was name tags or name those thank you messages. We tried to 3D print them. They would be all black, and then they'd say thank you in gold on top, which is like, it's kind of neat. That was just going to take us many, too many hours. So we switched over to laser cut, which is way faster. Um, but those sorts of interesting things are fun to play with. Other interesting and specific things, uh, well, we'll get into some more. There's other features that are in Bruce's Slicer that you can really go deep in the weeds with. Um, print in place is always fun if you're looking for advanced stuff and you haven't printed one of these. There's tons and tons of options of cool things that you can download. I particularly like this hand. It's like just on the border of creepy. Yeah, it's like just rocks. Yeah, 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 yeah. The bone and the rubber bands inside. It's the, it's the little wiggle of the fingers at the apex. Yeah. They get me. That's real bizarre. <laughs> but some of them are like very, like this is very clever. The little phone holder that has a snap, oh, uh, the dragon that uses all the scales to really hide the hinges. Or if you're trying to explain to a room full of middle schoolers what a what a crankshaft looks like, this could be really helpful. That was the frog that I printed. Yeah. Darcy's chair. Yep. Everybody. Yeah. This is a fun a fun one. Uh, also, that it's a the lid in the box. It's a neat one. It's a good video of the person designing and going through the process. So try these if you haven't yet. There's some great ones. Let's say you're down that, that road. If you want to design something like that, there's a few different pointers that you can pick up. Um, you can, if you're going to design a column coming up out of a surface, it's tempting in a 3D design software to design it just like this, like a cylinder that comes straight up with no problem. But it turns out it's much, much stronger to put a chamfer or a fillet right here because of the layer lines. Layer lines are always a point of weakness in a 3D print. And if you do this, you have like a single transition where you go from the horizontal to the vertical. And so it gives it like a stress riser, a place where it can crack. Um, if you do this and you add a small, and this can be small, like a two millimeter, one millimeter, doesn't need to be big. This little curve right here is enough that you get more contact as you make that transition, spreads it out and you get a stronger thing. Um, probably we're not gonna do it here because of the general use of our printers. But if you happen to have a 3D printer at home, Another thing that's interesting to try is to swap out your nozzle for a bigger one. So if we use 0.4 millimeter printer nozzles, but if you swapped it out to a 0.6, prints go faster. The layers are each a little bit thicker, so they happen quicker. Um, you can go even larger than that if you really just want to push a lot of filament through and build up thick walls, but it's an interesting thing. Um, and then there's these other sorts of like issues that you can think about where you may want to consider 
sort of how your piece is oriented, right? Benchy is printed this way always, but if you have a part that um, you're worried about its strength, usually in a 3D printer, there's a stronger orientation. Like if I am, if I have something that I need to be strong against a shearing force where the, like a pin like this may snap, oops, I may want to make the layers perpendicular to that so that there's no like obvious split between the layers in the, the area that I need strength. So you may choose to change the orientation of your pieces so you get strength where you want strength. And that can be a helpful piece if you're trying to make something strong or just print it on the Mark Forge and then you're happy and it all works the first time. Um, also, another thing that's really neat is vase mode. So if you have not been printing all the things and you really need to frantically make a gift for somebody, you can totally print something in vase mode and it works great. Um, and vase mode is just a continuous print that goes all the way up the thing. Most of the time for our 3D prints, you saw that it was layer, layer, like it goes across the whole layer, then it goes up. In vase mode, it can even be a continuous, always moving slightly and slowly up, which just prints the outside border of the shades. And so it can turn it into a vase. It has the distinct benefit of being much faster. And often it's a little quieter because it's only trying to do sideways and a little tiny notch of up. Thinking about that also, your infill and shells are really useful. If you've done a couple of prints and you're trying to think about how do I get better at this, it's good to talk about infill, Zunite. Infill and shell. Uh, for the infill, I would the default for Prusa slicer is right in between these at fifteen percent. If you want something that's strong, you might be tempted to go to crank it to a hundred. A hundred is usually like printer error territory. I don't think I'd ever go for an infill that's higher than eighty, because then you're trying to cram so much plastic into an area and it's all sort of messy when it goes in. I don't think I'd ever go higher than eighty. And really, it's about the shell. So think about your shell thickness when you think about strength of a part. Um, but it is, you know, it's interesting. And the base mode is, is a lot of fun to try as well. Where do you find base mode? Oh, that's a good question. I'm sorry, the question was, oh, yeah. where do we find base mode? Thank, thank you. <laughs> uh, in, in here, inside of this, and I know this is going to be small for people watching at home or on a phone, there's all sorts of interesting settings. Um, so there's layer height, there's a spiral base. So if you click this, we'll get base mode. Viral mode requires one perimeter, no top solid layers, zero percent fill density, no support material, and a few other things. So I'm going to say yes, and we'll just see what this does to the, to the doghouse. I don't know. Uh, oh, look at that. Um, so it's a little bizarre that I have a closed top. Normally you'd want an open top, but it's going to go through and no infill at all. It's just going to print from the bottom all the way up. It does sort of count the layers, but it's doing it all in in one go. But look at the print time for the total thing, 28 minutes. It's yeah. way faster because it's just zooming its way up. How much was it compared to before? That's a good question. Let's go back and take a look. How, how, how much time was it compared to what it was before? And so you get some of the time because of the infill. You're losing that. So 34, 24. It's a pretty simple print. But 10 minutes on a print that small is yeah. kind of a big difference. So there's a, a lot of options and things to consider. Having a flat top and you'll get a, a better vase. Maybe I can even go into the design and pull one of these numbers. This is a neat trick. This is the chop it off feature. And so I'm gonna just keep the lower part and you can perform a horizontal cut in your design. So it cut it like that. And if I go back to print settings, vase mode, this is a very strange vase. <laughs> but if we slice it like that, yeah, it leaves the top open as though presumably it were a base. So if you're really having a hard time getting something that you like out of 3D design software, you can do this and just design sort of the bulk outside of the shape. And if you have a flat top, it'll turn it into a nice vase for you. Hello. Um, so these are all neat features you can play around with. There's a bunch of others. You can get into the weeds on your filament settings. Like you may want to dial in What's the diameter of the filament you're trying, your extrusion multipliers and cooling in advance and all sorts of features that some people have very strong opinions about and I only sometimes can tell a difference. Uh, do you have strong opinions about 3D printing settings, Ruby? No, you should, you should you, never- No, you don't, like yeah. No, I do not. <laughs> Thank you, Ruby. 
Uh, all right, so we'll head back and take a look at some more other things. One of the, and this, was the, this is the model I used to make this design. Another thing that you can do is add modifiers to your print. And so this is like the blue one is a support modifier. And this one is a print modifier. So these can be interesting ways to make your prints more complex. Um, and scheduling pauses can be good. You can have as many as you want as you go up through the print. You feel like sitting around for the time of the print to happen, or you change out the color each time. You could have a hundred little layers. What's up, Ruby? Yeah, you can absolutely ask a question. You want to do it? Why would you want it to be more complex? Oh, uh, why would I want the print to the modifiers to be more complex? That is a good question. Um, in this case, I was going for a little bit of an aesthetic. It's like a skylight for the doghouse. Um, or here, I've, if you've got a model that's got weird supports everywhere, I could target in where I wanted support. So let me show you exactly what I'm talking about. Um, let's say I wanted to do, let's go, yeah, so it's, this dog is living the life. Let's go into here. If I wanted to add modifiers, I can click on this and add a support enforcer. So let's say I add a support enforcer that'll go right here. Support enforcer is just like that. You can move it around and scale it. So if I do something like this, or maybe I don't want to go all the way to the sides. I just want support sort of in the middle where it's past the 45 degree thing. I can do that. Um, then I can do supports for enforcers only and hit slice now. And it's going to slice my design and do and do that. I'll change my intel back to this again. And so here's I've got my supports there. Can I delete that? Yeah, that's the picture. So I get normal coloring back. So there's the supports and the inside. And you see they don't go all the way to the edges. So if sometimes supports can mar your surface features. And this way you can specifically target them to be in places where you want them to be. Um, then for the other modifiers, it looks like, oh yeah, it's just stopping up there at the top. The way that it does base mode is it takes the top layers and changes solid layers at the top. It went down to zero. You can modify things that way, or you can change around this. So it had, if we go back over to here, it freaked out, but let me slice it back like normal. So this is sort of a normal print where the top is like that. I can change the settings um, either by doing what was just there in the print settings and change the top layers back down to zero if that's what I want to do and slice it again. And it leaves the top sort of open. Oh, I like the way the gyroid infill looks. So that's kind of fun. Or if you have specific areas where you want that to work, you can specify it in a modifier where you may have sections that you want to be solid and other sections that you don't. So let me keep, keep playing around. Slice here. Let's add a modifier. Let's add a cylinder. That seems like fun. And so we're going to add a cylinder modifier back to here. And this I'm going to move around. So I'm going to just drag this guy up to the top over to the side with the red one. And so we've got this weird circle in the middle. So this doghouse is gonna get a circular skylight feature. And this generic cylinder, I wanna have the layers and perimeter settings. And I can specifically say in that area only, I want no top layers. So I'm able to adjust the settings just in that zone to zero top layers. And if I slice it now, I get top layers everywhere except where that cylinder was. Which is interesting, right? Like if you if you really wanted to fine tune control, you can get really specific with these tools. So it can be fun to play around and get it to work exactly the way you want. And these are these are sort of the more advanced 3D slicing things that you'd want to that you can explore. Oh, I want them like that dog house for mm -hmm. in this versus like in your single panel or like oh. No, that's a, a why. Why? So the question was, why would I do it in Prusa versus in Tinkercad? And that's a great question. In Tinkercad, I'm changing the 3D model, so the shape that I want to do. And with those tools that I was just showing, I was not changing the shape of the doghouse at all, but I was able to modify, except the slice. I suppose the slice did change the shape, but I was able to change the way the G code was being prepared. 
So I could, with a more surgical sort of precision, say I want the 3D printer to work exactly this way. Um, I could say specifically that I want some parts of it to be a little stronger than other parts, or that I want the skylight feature, or that I want to target where I need supports and only where I need supports. Like if you're printing a duck, you can put a little cylinder right under its under its bill. Try to put a yeah. cylinder under its bill. But how would you have like it's a weird feature that's pretty hidden. So those are the sorts of things that maybe you can start to explore as you think about your 3D prints. And in some places you might need it, in other places you might not. But it, in Prusa Slicer, like it just unassumingly says your support options are none, build plate only, support for enforcers only, or everywhere. And if you don't, it takes some digging to find what an enforcer is. So most of the time people will do none or everywhere and that's it. And and supports can really like make a part look kind of gross sometimes. Mm -hmm. So specifically managing them can be helpful to get shiny, nice looking prints. Um, yeah, especially the like the rainbow filament that you use. It's a really nice surface finish as long as nothing's touching it as it prints. Which is a big deal. I love that duck, but he is on the sink. Yeah. Because then he's low enough that I can't see his weird chin. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's totally fair. <laughs> Um, well, so these are, if you also, it's worth saying that there's a lot of filaments that you can try, um, like flexible filament would like, and I just saw Cura Slicer did a really cool thing to make flexible filament work better in prints, um, wood like filament that you can sand and stain really surprisingly well, um, glow in the dark UV sensitive. So it changes color when you bring it out into the sun, uh, conductive, like electrically conductive, PETG is a neat one. That's what the Prusas are actually printed out of when they have their printed parts. There's bronze, like where they put bronze in the filament. Um, it looks weirdly kind of metal and very kind of not, um, but it's neat. And then dissolvable filament, which is a great way to put in supports if you have two extruders. So you can print all of your supports in just dissolvable material, and then it just floats away in hot water. Could you use dissolvable for, like, if I wanted to cast something? Oh, like the Kaya cast. Huh? I don't know. Probably, but like, yeah. if I really want to be neurotic about it, I'm like, I feel like you could burn out. Yeah, the burnout's not going to be an issue. Yeah. And I okay. think it would, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it would, the wet that it would take to get it out <laughs> might be a problem for your plastic. Yeah, when you're like in that, like, putting your hands in plastic, it's going to dissolve in the plastic. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> So it would be because the plaster will get warm as it sets. So I think I think the resounding answer is no. You can't okay. use it for plaster, which is helpful. <laughs> it's helpful if you were doing like some sort of large cavity that was difficult otherwise. Mm. Yeah, that but needed like a finished interior. Like if you were making any molds. Sure. And you needed to make make the cavity. Yeah. No. That, there is. It's neat to know it's an option, right? Like it's helpful. Um. And then another thing that should that we should point out is that there's Shapeways and there are others. There's a Shapeways in Brooklyn, where if you have something you really can't make here, which is a surprising challenge to have, is that you may, because we can do a lot of things, you could order it from them. And like the reason you do that is that there's 90 plus materials in finishing. So if you want something 3D printed and I think they'll do gold, yeah. you can get it in gold. Um, it's wild what they're able to print with, and they're on incredible, incredible resolution in their machines. Things that are just like un unbelievable uh, print qualities that you can you can get from them. They're really, really good at miniatures. I don't know why of those things are their design examples, but they're really, really good at miniatures because they have like professional industrial level detail machines that are big enough that they're like a, a telephone booth. Yeah. Color. And yeah, and the color printers, they have full color printers for different crazy, yeah, it's bonkers. Um, so if you really want to go super ornate, Shapeways, which I think is a Belgian maybe, something in Northern Europe, but then they have a Brooklyn store is, is really cool. Which, yeah, they'll print it out for you and send it to you. Or do they make the design? I, generally, people send designs to them and say, print this for me and then send it back. It's pretty expensive. So like you can't expect it to be cheap, but they print it, they print a whole bunch all in one batch. They like fill their print volume and then they just 
get pull them out, they clean them, and then they ship them out. You can actually go to the place in Brooklyn, and they'll give you a tour. Also, so the difference between like going to the residence place and the place where you get it. Yeah. It's essentially, oh, how much can you pay for an hour of gas and your body? Right, and the um, Shapeways has a whole range of materials at Form Labs or better quality. So, like there, if you want something to be magical level of quality, they they have the industrial top of the line machines. So, like if you really need super high precision, they're the way to go. But you're also going to need to be ready to pay for what they're going to charge. But it's neat to know that it exists. Yeah, um, 3D scanning. So this is a neat thing to do as well. Um, 3D modeling may have you down and that's reasonable. It is frustrating and hard. But if that's the case, you can 3D scan all sorts of things. And it's lots of fun. Um, this is my head, 3D scanned. Um, Google Maps is also built in scans from the various photos we have from over, overhead shots from space. So these are built from satellites and sometimes flyovers of cities where you get the three-dimensional build out. And this is new, the New Haven Green, um, but that's built from data from the earth. And so we have decades of data where satellites fly over at slightly different angles and that can be reconstructed into three-dimensional data. It's kind of wild. That's coming from space and flyovers. Um, in video games, what? No, definitely not creepy. In video games, they'll do this with people where they scan their entire head and then like have them act in that space so they can capture even motion and sort of how their bones and jaw and everything are aligned. Um, where this is just surrounded with cameras. I can't, yeah, it's it's full photogrammetry. Photogrammetry is like a really interesting process. Um, and that's what these are as well. So most 3D scanners are often photogrammetry. And I just installed this one on my phone and we can play around with it but it's free and it works pretty well. It's not like perfect, but it's it's pretty good. If you have, uh, this is an open source one. This is the Autodesk one, which better be good for 375 a year. Um, but you know, they have it for like architectural, all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So there's some really cool options. And then Agrisoft is another paid one. This one is, I don't, I don't know. I'm sure it's fine. It just scares me when this is what a website looks like. But I'm sure it's good. Yeah. It's fine. Um, typically, when you do that, you get an STL. It used to be there was no color in them, but now most of the time you do a scan and it maps color onto it as well. We the one that I did downstairs as an example is Ashley's uh, mug, and I can show you that when when we're all together. But it, the few people who got to see it, it came out pretty well, right? I did okay. Um, so, and that was just partially moving around. It has like a bunch of dots. It shows you a point cloud. And when all the dots are green, you take a picture and it just, it just kind of works. So it's fun to play around with. Um, the iPhone has much better of this. If you have one of the highest end iPhones or an iPad Pro, there's some really cool options. There is also, sometimes you may get very good ones. Then you get structured light scanners where there's a projector involved. So this is a butterfly down here and they're projecting lines onto the butterfly, like light and dark lines. And then the scanner sort of looks at how those lines get distorted and then it can build the 3D shape from there. It presents a whole bunch of scan of structured light like this. And then you can scan the piece. You may get rotary tables that play along. So it moves the part rotationally. The ones for your phone keep track of how the camera moves. So they can do that without the part needing to spin. And sometimes they're really interesting high-end ones. Like a, a really good scanner is going to be north of $1,000 for sure. For like a pretty, like not even the best, but like a good a company may want to use this to scan parts. Lockheed Martin probably has a dozen. They're like $1,500 a pop for a nice scanner. But it's a phone app and you can do a, a free phone app version that's pretty okay. Um, in addition to that, there's Mesh Mixer, which is from Autodesk that you can manipulate those STLs once they exist. But that's another, it's a whole other CAD software that's tricky to learn also in its own ways. Um, but a cool one that's relatively new and it may be relevant to you is LiDAR scanning. So the iPad Pro has the app or has the ability to do this where in addition to taking photos, it sends out laser beams 
like photodiode lasers to measure distances and do all sorts of crazy stuff. I think, yeah, some of the, yep, some of the newer iPhones have it as well. Um, I think three years ago, the iPad Pro was the only one, and now lots of them have it, um, but they can 3D scan. It's also added extra layers of security to the, like that 3D scanning is added to face ID security because it can get the geometry of your face a little bit. And so these sorts of things are really helpful. And it's really helpful for if you want to scan a space. Real uh, contractors will walk into places with iPads just to scan a kitchen so they can get the size and dimensions of the kitchen so they know what the cabinet sizes are that they can replace and put in. This is fully anecdotal, but I, a human I knew, um, for, I real I start. I was gonna explain the kitchen and realized it was super long and irrelevant. Um, she worked for like the DEP. Yeah, sure. Yeah, um, on the largest island off of Washington State, mm. and we visited. We were, we were out there for a, a thing, and we visited her office. And on her wall was this enormous blown up photo of the island that she was on done in LIDAR and you couldn't, I mean, she pointed out, but you could see where the glaciers had like come across the island yeah. and just left these like huge, like it was like cloth, just like enormous gouges in it. It was, um, There's a bunch of real fun ones off of Washington. It's, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, he would know yeah. from there. This is a while you're while you're searching. Yeah, while I'm looking it up. Here's here's a fun one. This is planes flown over the jungle. LIDAR is pretty good at going through the trees. So here is something from the Amazon jungle, an uh, ancient city that they didn't know existed until they flew over with LIDAR to try and get the, the profile of the land. So you can see there's definitely like a city sort of complex down there. It's um, called Bidby Island. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've camped on that one. Yeah. yeah. It's beautiful. They had horses. It was mm -hmm. excellent. Uh, here's the, oh, here's, come on, play a little video. The whole West Coast is just doing a good job. Yeah, they are. Look at this. Isn't that bonkers? So that's like, that's the Canvas app that if you have the iPad Pro, you can do, and look at them measuring stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's real neat. Uh, there's a ton of cool options. It's real cool. Um, this is, but Lex, let's talk pricing is uh, always, always scary. So, you know, that's, that's a whole thing. I'm sure. Okay. All right. Cool. That's awesome. Do you know what that equivalent free app is called? No. You can, oh, oh. Okay, awesome. Is it, I think I might have it too. Oh, all right. We might get the equivalent free app name for the recording. Um, there's other, so like let, those are all phone quality scans, which is really neat. But one thing that's a cool part of humanity is that we're doing a good job trying to scan all of our cultural heritage stuff. And so there are people going through trying to scan art from different parts of the world and put it together in a digital repository. And then from there, you can download it or like a kid who would never be able to go to the museum or like it's on another part of the world. Like you can directly have this and you can 3D print it. Like, yeah, there's some really cool things like that. Like here's, things like what? Uh, there's, oh yeah, this is a good point. 3D tours of the Louvre and other other places that take art and make it. That's with VR. It seems like things might be possible. <laughs> it's I'm excited. You cannot vomit. <laughs> I'm excited to see where it goes, but it's it's definitely like a lot of. We're still we're still growing into that one, but like look yeah. at look at how cool some of this stuff is that you would be able to get to like look at this Jupiter as an eagle from Ganymede. And this is a free download. So like these are downloaded at insane quality because they're done with professional, like it's taking a long time to download. It's a 47 megabyte STL, um, but we can open it right up in Prusa Slicer and it will have no problem with that. So I'm going to go to new project, not mess with- Putting that on top of the dog house. No, the, <laughs> the dog house. No, the, the sad dog house is, uh, it's time to go. 
And let's upgrade to the full size. We need gods. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, we need this big one. Uh, all right. So now maybe it's finished the download. Yeah, here it is. And it's going to take a minute to load. But this is, but now you're talking about incredible. Oh, jam. It's yeah. Outside the train area. It's definitely outside the train area. But you take these things and we can scale them so that it would be something you could put on your shelf. And like, how cool if you're an art teacher to be able to take sculpture that otherwise would be inaccessible to your kids and say, let's pick this one up and look at it. And this may take, you know, if I do this slice on this thing, it's going to, it's going to take two days to print. Like it's not going to be fast, but if you're, if you've got a printer in the corner of your classroom, you can just set these things to go. What a neat way to add some culture. To, to make it accessible to a kid that otherwise wouldn't be able to see it. And you know what? Not, I mean, like the 3D printers that we have couldn't do it unless you did it in pieces, but um, how, like, what a great way to have, like, expensive looking art oh, in your house. That's true. So I found out, if, again, how is irrelevant, um, that, like, really rich people who have, like, the high rise apartments in the city in Manhattan, whatever, uh, all of their statues are actually just hollow cast because the buildings can't support like that sort of weight. So there's entire companies that specialize in like recreating statues hollow. Yeah. 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 That's wild. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, they just like it's just like hollow plaster That's but you could 3d print and then just like yeah. do a spin on it or only 19 hours wow well, that's not as bad as i thought it would be um but this i mean this is incredible high art that is neat to see printed this way and you could fully print it from pieces and there's marble look filament also cool. so you can like make it sort of look like marble in the 3d print uh you can be nerdy and classy all at once and it's great the, although I don't think those are necessarily opposed to that. Okay, so back to this. There's those are all 3D scan and 3D scan related things. I will say it's don't expect your first one of these to go great. Um, there is quirkiness in an app, but downloading and printing one of those nice ones, if you have a favorite sculpture or you really want this dog to guard your fridge, um, <laughs> you totally can. And that's going to work for this hand. That's a great Halloween. Maybe that's what we need for the useless box. Um, but in in here, there's other skills that you can get at. So other things that you can do to, to get more advanced. Two and a half deconstruction, we've talked about many times. If the designs that you've seen me show off here have been painful, Slicer for Fusion 360 is a great way to make it a much simpler process. So like, let me, I've got Fusion 360 pulled up here and I'm gonna make a brand new design just so that we have something relatively simple. We're gonna do a sketch. And if my computer will play nicely in the sandbox, we'll do something pretty straightforward. So I'm gonna take and make a circle over here and a line and we're gonna make a donut. And that's it. Okay, so we'll do a quick finish that sketch and then we'll revolve this circle around this axis and do a full rotation and boom, we got a thing. Isn't that nice? Now I take the body for this and I can right click and save as a mesh. And this thing I can download, you could send it straight to a 3D print utility, like here's a few that would do it. So you could send directly to Shapeways if you get their extension, but I don't ever do that. Um, I'm just gonna download this. And so it'll be saved onto my downloads, just right there, body one donut. Uh, that's maybe how you spell it. And then the next thing that we do is I can open up Slicer for Fusion 360. And this is gonna take a minute to load probably, but that will accept an STL. It's loading on the other screen, which of course it is. And so this I can pull up into view. DDT, Transit Service, thank you. It is an extension, although for it's been unsupported for a while. This used to be totally free and they're happy to give it away. And then they, it's still free, but it's really hard to find, um, but they're not cranky. It doesn't, it has an open license right now because it's sort of in a Nexus world and so they pretend like it doesn't exist. Um, Cause it's a paid extension you can get if you want to fully integrate it. 
Good news, I have the installer somewhere in a, in a folder saved that we can all share. <laughs> um, so in here, you just import in whatever STL you want. This is going to be hard to see, but eventually once it opens up, we'll install, we'll get the donut um, and import it into, oh, here, okay, slowly getting there. Uh, computers having a moment, donut. And so it will bring in this STL. And the neat thing about this process is you've still got sort of the Fusion 360 Tinkercad ecosystem. So lots of it feels similar. Um, but over here, you can choose your construction technique. And so you could make it out of a series of stack slices. So it takes your donut and turns it into a bunch of sliced things. So this is instant two and a half D. In order to build that, it's just going to cut it out of a series of layers. And you can make the thing. So if you have some large sculpture that you want to build, you can build its base out of foam and it'll build up the structure for you. Like we could make that bird out of this and you'd have a foam maybe version or you can cut it out of layers of wood. Um, if you don't like stack slices, you can do interlocked slices. So it makes a little waffle like that. That's see-through and neat. Um, so this is another one that's fun. If you want to dial in like the orientation or how many of these there are, you can add in extras or you can remove them. Um, if it starts to break in different ways, it'll throw a little flag like those are blue. So they're not connected to anything telling you that it's broken, um, but it can be really fun. All of this is updating over here on the fly and you can choose the size of material that you want to use. So like here's the map board from downstairs. So this is this is the size that I would use if I was using the map board that we literally have down there. Um, and so all of that you can program in with a little pencil. There's some that are really fun. This is how I made those um, radial slices you can do. You can change sort of the orientation. See how they're they're radial this way. Maybe for the donut, it would make more sense for me to change the axis. And that you can do with your slice direction tool. So grab this and then rotate around like that. And it's cranky about it, but it appears to have sort of worked. Oh, I think it doesn't like that the, I don't know, something, something's weird with it that it doesn't want. Oh, maybe I need to go. There's a, there's a lot of ways that this can be strange. It's fairly smart, but it's not like magical, perfect smart. So you have to play with the software to get it to work for you. Um, but there's all sorts of options if you wanted to folded panels. So if you wanted to do this, look at that fun printout. Oh, cool. It turns the surface into a thing that you fold and bend into place. So you can make some neat geometry that way. These are all different to an, and you can optimize the panels different ways. You can do 3D slices. I don't even know what this one is. 3D slices. Oh, slices like this that give you curvature. So you can get the individual slices. So if you wanted to make this on the CNC and cut each individual slice, this is the way to do it. Um, so you can get that straight out of the machine without having to fight too hard. Um, then if you wanted to do, if we go back to something like folded panels or stack slices, and our orientation slice direction is still there. You can point this, let's go somewhere reasonable like that. If I wanted to download all this, it's just a simple get plans. There's a button that outputs it all. And then these are going to come out in the, I think this is probably 12, it numbers them for you in a different color. So you can choose your cut setting in that different option. You can download as an EPS, a PDF, or a DXF, whichever is your favorite, uh, export to your computer or to a Fusion 360 team, which probably none of us are doing. But those are all very cool options for how this works. It'll even number like these are, this is layer 43 part two. So it does all of that stuff to try and keep you organized. These are even alignment holes that you can have. If you put like alignment pins in them, there's some really cool stuff that this software can do to make a, a two and a half D process that's automatic. Um, so it's great. This is the, the it's absolutely how we're going to make a robot for the courtyard. It's it's really nice. Um, so that let's that's the easy way. And here's the the <laughs> is it okay that you fully lost me? Oh, on on on. I oh, don't even know. On this on this software just. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. No, that's that's fine. I don't fine. have to catch up. I just want. To... No, you're good. I think we should we should unpack that a little more. Like this rhinoceros head, this rhino head is just a bunch of layers of cardboard that you've cut, 
into the weird shape. Like if you've got an MRI, you know, it's a bunch of images mm -hmm. of the thing. Yeah. It's those, but then you can physically cut them like with the laser and then stack them up. So oh, like that janky dinosaur head we have yeah. in boots sometimes. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly that. Okay. And so this is, if I took all of these and I stacked them, I would have, and I got to get out of the get plans mode, which is always harder than it should be. Exit, close. There is a back button. Yeah. So it, this is the plan for making all of these. Okay. So if I wanted to stack those up and make this donut, I totally could. Okay. Um, that's that's what it's for. Um, a donut is maybe not the best example, but there's others that are that are neat. And there's so many little knobs on this to play with that it comes out great. Another thing, and this is one that I want to not forget, the manufacturing settings up here, it's easy to skip, but the manufacturing settings somewhere in here let you dial in, um, like there's assembly steps, it'll tell you that for how you'd assemble it out of cardboard, which is fun, but it'll also show you assembly steps where if it needs to, you can have it designed for use with, um, with a laser where there's no dog bones. We talked a little bit about dog bones where you can say, I'm gonna make this with a CNC so it makes the extra cut. So that just works. You don't have to like go through the fight of struggling with it after the fact. This software is really a gold mine. They deserve to make us pay for it. And I'm really glad this installer is still free on the internet in places. And that's why I saved it. Um, it's, yeah, 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 we can absolutely. It's, it's in my Google Drive. Well, I'll share it happily. Um, so for all of these things, there's lots of fun to be had. There's, it's a lot of really cool options, but it's the easy way to do stuff. If you want, you can also manually two and a half D design things. It is far more effort, but you get very fine tuned control in the design. These are three of many, many examples that I have been a part of. This is a little free library that Kate is all about. She wants to make a whole army of these and I'm into it. Uh, this is two of them fitting onto one sheet of plywood. And so this is designed to work with three quarter inch sheathing. So it's designed to fit two of them onto a board and by sort of back and forth design between Fusion 360's design and manufacturer settings, you can set that up so that you optimize your material really nicely. Somebody in the last cohort wanted to make a piano table. And so this is for their, their electric keyboard. Um, and so we cut this out. They had made these. It was it's Laura, the jewelry facilitator. Lisa. Wow, my brain's gone. It's okay. You yeah. know her name. Okay. I know her name. Uh, <laughs> so Lisa had taken these. Uh, she'd made prints, I think, of these flowers. She does interesting light expo exposure stuff. And so, if you ever get the chance, look at the uh, apron she wears when she's like on her facilitator hours or just like working on a project. She like yeah, she bleach. Sun bleach? She used a dye that sets when it's out in the sun and the flowers block the settings. So like you know, the flower areas stay white, but all the rest of it turns blue. It's it's real. Uh, there's a name for it. Do you happen to know the name? No, but it's it's it's, it's a cyanotype. Yeah, it's cyanotype. Okay, I don't know. Right? No, it changes. It changes. It changed only in the like setting of it. The one time. The one time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Awesome. So it's a same Um, and then, that third thing. Oh, this right? third thing. What a great preview for our next units. <laughs> um, we've got it up here in the front of the room, and so probably you can see Ruby's going to be playing around with it a little bit. But this is the useless box that we're going to be playing with over the electronics unit. It's one of the two major projects that you can choose. If you're in the room, we want you to come play with the useless box in a minute. Um, it's a box that when you turn it on, its only job is to turn itself back off. And it's a lot of fun in its uselessness and it's a fun way to explore some of the electronics concepts that we're going to try and cover in the next month or so. Um, but this is one of the projects that you can do. So I've designed, Iris designed the first one out of just flat materials. Um, and then I've designed it twice again to try and get it to work, which is fine by hands. The first one took a bunch of hours. The second one took a lot less hours. And that's just how it goes. Um, and so you can do this manually. And this is built out of the three millimeter plywood. So it works great. It's easy to laser cut. Actually making one takes six minutes on the laser after the design took a lot longer than that. Um, but it's not a 3D print. Like it, it has a different feel and texture than if we were 3D printing the same box. So there's some 
some real value. Um, also, it's neat that you can scale up and down without a big problem. So there's a fun feature. There. So how do you possibly do that? Let's say you've 3D modeled it like I did for all of these. You're going to try and get DXFs or SVGs out of your 3D model to get the thing. If you're a big Tinkercad fan, we did play with this once. You'll export an SVG, and that gives you whatever's on the work plane. And that works really, really well. So if we go back over to, uh, I do not have Tinkercad open, but we can totally open it. If we go to Tinkercad, which is probably openable here, in Tinkercad, we can set something on the work plane and, and do the download. Um, that'll take a minute to load. But Tinkercad works just fine. The SVG that comes out, you can put right into Inkscape and then right onto the laser. That's the best way to do it if you wanted to make something like that happen uh, because it's it's totally ready to be worked with on the laser or even the um, plotter, if the vinyl plotter, if you wanted to make a very specific like mask for a spray paint that had to fit certain dimensions or you wanted to have fine-tuned control, it can be really helpful. If you want to do it in Fusion 360, this is sort of the simplest way where you can take any sketch in your design and turn it into a DXF like this. And that will also open into Inkscape. So any surface that you have um, that's a, a DXF sketch, you can save. So if I pop back over to Fusion that I have open here. Oh boy, sign in. <laughs> Just one moment, please. You can totally take your design and <laughs> logging in, log something. Oh, yeah, the like a cold theater. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So in here, you take any sketch that you've got in a design and you can export it. The sketches would show up over here in your browser. Um, it's taking a minute for this to log in, so we'll we'll pop back over in a second. Um, but this works really well. The examples from here are increasingly, I myself have learned about the manufacturer part of Fusion 360, where it will automatically lay these things out. It is sad to say a feature that you get in the free education tier or in the paid tier, that it'll automatically take all these pieces and lay them out for you. And it'll space them correctly so that you can run the tool without any issue. It's a really convenient feature. DeepNest will also do that. So if you have the STLs that you've downloaded, DeepNest will do it for you. Um, and it works really nicely. But these are all both, these are both options to do it in that process or if you just download it straight out of here. This has got something. Nope, it's taking its minute. Okay, all right. But this is super useful and I've used it for all sorts of things. So we talked about the table. Here's stools. This is one that would be, it was a perennial lesson I would do with students. They design stools and then we would make them. Uh, we would do this at multiple scales. So they would make this and then we'd cut them out on the laser to test them because the laser uh, cardboard version is much cheaper and much faster to make. Plus it's also fun to tell kids your assignment for the day is to make a stool sample, <laughs> a, little, a little test. Uh, it was just kind of fun. And then we would cut out their stool that they had designed on a larger scale. So this is a great one if you follow. There's a video tutorial that I made to show this process. But it also can work for various different types of furniture. So like this was a rolly cart that we were we actually mounted some, some fab equipment onto a bus. This was a cart that would go on a bus that would house a vinyl plotter and a computer and all that to run it. Um, so there's lots of different things you can do in these cars and this instrument. They were all designed with this. DXF export process in mind. Um, and and manual, I didn't understand the manufacturer part of Fusion 360 at that point. It was the like manually and physically download each DXF, arrange them with something like DeepNest or just doing it by hand. And all of that can be done in a number of ways to make these things productively. It's really, I like this process because it lets you make out of a quality material like a plywood and it works really nicely. You can also build out a cardboard or other things and it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, so the goals for this week are just to try and deep dive into some of those things. Um, if you haven't played around in one of the more advanced softwares, just to turn it on, that's probably worth doing. 
we do really like the idea of getting people into slicer for fusion or if you didn't ever get a chance to play around with maker case or that's the 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 um the other one that will do this automatically for you so like if all of that design stuff looks fun but it seems like a lot you can go to festy.info slash boxes dot pi and i will totally put this link into the foundations chat oh i love it quick but these are all two and a half D designs that could be really useful. If you haven't scrolled through here yet, I would solidly recommend that you do. And these are all two and a half D designs. And there's tons and tons of settings that you can dial in on these, which will make you feel like it, you fully participated in the design process. Like this is the, the sizing of the thing. Do you want them to be inside or outside measurements? The lid height, the split ID, the thickness of your material. Probably it's 3.175 if it's an eighth inch material here, but you want to measure with calipers very carefully. And then it'll output all these things. You can have it generate those, and here's the design. So it just fits it right out. It's easy to put into the laser. You can play with that. This would be a fun thing to do. Just like the assembly process of that can be fun and tricky. So play around with those, try and deepen. And what we really want is to have good discussions about how how bizarre all of these things can be and try and really nerd out on the details of going with an ornate 3D print or making something two and a half D either from scratch or with slicer and finding some way to really go deep into this digital fab skill set because the the more you develop these skills and these are really skills rather than tools the more interesting your designs can become and the faster you can crank them out which is hard to overstate the value of how quickly quickly producing a thing is really, really useful. So that is our talk and some of the finer points, the more advanced parts of digital designs. Uh, Ruby, do you have any things? It looks like you're up to something over there. Is there any stuff that we've missed? Just pasting the docs link on Slack. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so there's tons of cool options and we really like to hear from people about oh yeah we have some super specific assignment options design something to print without supports is really fun 3d scan something oh, i think i needed to update the slide or do something two and a half d so these are really cool 3d scanning something is lots of fun if you want to get that app oh and oh yeah 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 totally i want to see the things that you did 